I suppose uh, it's inevitable with the sad uh, demise of uh, Dolores, the fact that Alan isn't getting any younger, um, that this question will probably arise more and more. We hear, obviously, that uh, Kathleen Zellner <laughs> is of the opinion that uh, the state of Wisconsin just want Stephen Avery to go away and die in prison quietly, please, you know. Um, and my, I myself, in a conversation with Sheriff Hermie, he once stopped me and said, Paul, let me assure you, Stephen Avery will spend the rest of his life in prison. Um, and so obviously one of the other concerns is, you know, how does the process happen whereby if somebody who has been wrongfully convicted um, how do they then um, seek damages if they're no longer around? Um, this question has um, puzzled me a couple of times. Uh, sorry, quite a few times, but I've got a couple examples of what happens. Um, I'd like to share them with you. Uh, one of them, of course, is the very, very sad story of Khalif Brader. If you haven't watched the Netflix documentary Time, um, Please do so, although be warned, it is not pleasant viewing. Um, let's just quickly click on this so I've got the right one up for you. Yeah, here we go. Um, in fact, we'll do this one first. We'll do, we'll do this one first, sorry. Um, we'll come to Khalif Browder in a moment. Uh, this is another one that I came across of Khalif. Cleve Heidelberg. Um, again, re really awful case. Um, so Cleve Heidelberg's son files 100 million lawsuit in 1970 conviction. Um, the estate of Clive Heidelberg has sued the officers and deputies who worked his case 48 years ago, as well as current state's attorney Jerry Brady for loss of liberty and the terrible hardship that Mr. Heidelberg endured and suffered as a result of the defendant's misconduct. Now, unfortunately, Cle uh, Cleve Heidelberg died in March after the judge reversed his conviction and allowed him to post bond. Filed Thursday in U.S. District Court in Peoria, the 52-page document continues with the same assertions that Heidelberg had made for years that he didn't kill Peoria County Sheriff Sergeant Raymond Espinosa on May 22nd, 1970. And it was another man, James Clark, who pulled the trigger. Clark, Heidelberg attorneys have argued in the past few years, was angry that his brother Mark was killed by police with Fred Hampton, the state leader of the Black Panther Party during a police raid December the 4th, 1969 in Chicago. The suit seeks more than 100 million. Heidelberg's son, Stephen, is representing the Heidelberg estate in the case. Also named in the civil suit are the city of Peoria and Peoria County. It contends that the various officers, deputies and prosecutors at the time either lied about the evidence or ignored what, what were obvious flaws in the case. It also goes on to state that Heidelberg suffered the loss of liberty great mental anguish, humiliation, degradation, physical and emotional pain and suffering and other grievous injuries and damages. Several counts were brought under section 1983 of the US code, which deals with civil rights violations, such as unlawful detention, due process, as well as claims under Illinois law, such as conspiracy and the intent to inflict emotional distress. Last August, A local judge threw out Heidelberg's conviction, but not the case, saying he found videotaped statements made by Matthew Clark credible and new evidence that could tip the scales at a new trial. Clark gave a videotaped deposition recently where he said his now deceased brother, James Clark, shot and killed Espinosa during a botched attempted robbery at the old Bellevue Drive-In Theatre on May the 26th, 1970. Prosecutors have said those allegations have been known for decades and either rebuffed or ignored by local and state judges throughout the various appeals. When asked why he waited until his brother James' death in June 2015 to come forward, Matthew said he wanted to protect his brother, but that didn't mean it was false. 
the testimony is the truth. Klaus Cleve spent 40 something years being locked up. He didn't do it. I couldn't say anything before because of my brother and because I didn't know how much time I had left. He said on the videotape, Matthew Clark is suffering from cancer and said his prognosis wasn't good on the video, which was made in late 2016. Needleworth's case is currently pending in the state appellate court as prosecutors had appealed the local judge's decision. And I tried to find some more about it, but that appears to be still the latest state of play. Interesting that this is an article for the Gannett Group, which of course is one of the groups that uh, is, is a group that uh, obviously uh, John Farrak worked with when he was the uh, work for the uh, the newspaper in Manitowoc. Now that next one I wanted to share, let's get this set up. Post present, that's the name of the newspaper I was trying to think of, the Post Crescent, when, when John Farrakh worked for the Post Crescent, that's, that's part of the Gannett group. As I say, if you haven't yet watched Time, the Khalif Browder story, some of you might not want to because it is quite horrific. Um, in some ways very similar to When They See Us, the story of the uh, Central Park Five, or as they call themselves now, the Exonerated Five. But it's one of these things that really you have to see to be to believe and to see exactly what what goes on. I mentioned time the Khalif Browder story because this article actually doesn't mention it. Um, anyway, let's uh, let's have a look through. New York City reaches. 3.3 million settle with Khalif Browder's family. So this is Khalif Browder, no longer with us, but his family compensated to the tune of 3.3 million. New York City officials on Thursday announced a 3.3 million settlement with the family of Khalif Browder, who died by suicide after spending nearly three years in Rikers Island, mostly most of it in solitary confinement. On Thursday, New York City's Law Department announced it had reached a 3.3 million settlement with Khalif Browder's family. Isn't it amazing that the Law Department has 3.3 million to spare? They could have saved themselves so much money. The young man from the Bronx, who spent three years detained on Rikers Island without being tried or convicted, was accused of stealing a backpack. Near, nearly two of Browder's three years in jail was spent in solitary confinement. He was released in 2013 after the charge were dropped and in 2015, plagued by what he said was the mental anguish and trauma from his time in jail, he hung himself in his mother's home. Khalif Browder's story helped inspire numerous reforms to the justice system to prevent this tragedy from ever happening again including an end to punitive segregation for young people on Rikers Island. Nicholas Pellucci, a spokesman for the City Law Department, told NPR in an email statement, We hope that this settlement and our continuing reforms help bring some measure of closure to the Browder family, he added. According to the New York Times, the civil rights and wrongful death action is before a judge in state Supreme Court in the Bronx. Browder's family was satisfied with the settlement, Scott Minecki, one of the families and attorneys, told NPR. The family is pleased that they can bring closure to this part of the matter, but hopes that the na national recognition that the case gave to the need of prison reform and dealing with younger individuals continues, he said. Browder adamantly maintained his innocence throughout his incarceration which he served because his family couldn't afford to pay his $3,000 bail, which at the point of his arrest was something like five or six hundred pounds, five or six hundred dollars, but then escalated. Um, and there is some um, 
veiled vale criticism in the in the documentary of his actual father, who's a strange father, who who would have had that kind of money to have helped his son, decided not to, but is now one of the people benefiting from the settlement. Over the years, he rejected numerous guilty plea deals that would have allowed him to escape what he said were savage conditions in the prison. He described instances of violent beatings and torment at the hands of both other inmates and guards. He said he was starved and kept in filthy surroundings, and he spoke of intolerable mental anguish suffered at the hands of prosecutors who repeatedly delayed his trial in the Bronx infamously overburdened court system. I think he was due to go to trial on about 30 separate occasions and they kept delaying it and delaying it and delaying it. Even after being out in the free world for some time, cleared of any wrongdoing and suddenly thrust into the spotlight as a symbol of New York City's pernicious and crippled criminal justice system, Khalif Browder feared he'd been changed forever, that he had been damaged at the core of his innermost self after nearly three years of being caged, mostly in solitary confinement as an adolescent on Rikers Island after he was arrested. People tell me because I have this case against the city, I'm all right, but I'm not all right, Prada said. The case against the young African-American man who was jailed in 2010 at 16 was eventually dismissed without ever being tried. There you go. After 31 court appearances before eight different judges, the charges against Browder were dropped. And again, not to spoil the story, but one judge was brought in. She cleared 70 odd cases in one day by just getting everybody just to plead guilty and just be just accept the fact that, you know, just 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 plead guilty. It'll get the system all done and dusted. You know, it's good. It's a good outcome for everybody. Nonsense, is it? His accuser had left the country and the prosecution could not move forward with the case. Meanwhile, Browder had gone from teenager to adult, missing his high school graduation and enduring a brutal existence within the prison confines, at least half of which was spent alone in a 12 by 7 cell. When he spoke to the magazine, he had filed a lawsuit against the city, the New York City Police Department, the Bronx District Attorney, and the Department of Corrections. Still, he worried that no amount of money would make him whole again. Well, no amount of money can ever do that. In the end, it proved too much. In 2015, he took his own life. He was only 22. The New York's, Yorker story catapulted Browder to the fore of the national debate about the criminal justice system, especially as it applies to minors. Two months after the story ran, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, Blasio put an end to the city's use of solitary confinement for 16 to 17 year olds. Upon learning of Browder's death, de Blasio said, Khalif's story helped inspire our efforts on Rikers Island, where we are working to ensure no New Yorkers spend years in jail waiting for the day in court. Later, when plans to permanently shutter the prison were set in motion, de Blasio pointed to Browder's suicide as a wake up call to the city, adding that his death shook the whole city and opened everyone's eyes to make people think twice. The city plans to permanently close Rikers Island and has proposed establishing smaller neighborhood-based facilities. In 2016, former President Barack Obama similarly, similarly noted Browder's experiences when he enacted a ban on solitary confinement for juveniles detained in federal prisons. Browder struggled to find his place outside of Rikers Island after he was released. Before I went to jail, I didn't know about a lot of stuff. And now that I'm aware, I'm paranoid, he told the New Yorker. It was a feeling he couldn't shake, even as he was championed as the catalyst for much needed change. I feel like I was robbed of my happiness, he said. There's a correction here. A previous version of the story said Khalid Browder was released in 2015. He was released in 2013. And, you know, let's just accept the fact that Dolores obviously is gone. Alan, we don't know how long he's going to stay. Um, Steve next year, I believe, is going to be 60 years old. 
um, you know, um, how long will his case take to finally get settled? Um, I'm sure that, you know, as, as most of us have seen, um, the Wisconsin sit legal system procrastinates just as much as that in New York. It's, it's really designed to um, allow everybody involved in Steve's case to pass away quietly. Um, and then at some point in the future, maybe some other generation will come along and uh, correct the wrongs. Um, which seems a real shame for, for Steve. Hopefully Brendan will um, get to enjoy some freedom, some quality time. Um, but then, you know, the, the encouraging thing is, we, we know, speaking with Pete, Pete and Steve are still close. You know, Pete Darcy is still close to Steve and they share, um, they actually share some, some kids together, don't they? The uh, um, Laurie who was married to Steve, then married Pete. So they very much kept it as a, as a Darcy Avery clan. Um, and, and there will be people further on down the line who will benefit. Now, hopefully, you know, John Farrakh talks about the um, state of Wisconsin wanting to bring making a murder documentaries to a juddering halt. Um, whether they can do that or not, um, I don't know. Um, there was also, a, a, somebody pointed out that, you know, even if they did have a, an evidentiary hearing, they might ban cameras. Well, uh, we've come across that before in making a murder, haven't we? When the, you know, the Seventh Circuit don't allow cameras, didn't matter. We got the audio and we got an artist to draw pictures of the various characters. So we got to hear everything. Um, I mean, that they could even at some point bring in actors to play the parts of the various people if, if the evidentiary hearing wasn't to be filmed. Um, so yeah, I, I, I realize it's a, it's a sensitive subject that, you know, is Steve gonna be around long enough to enjoy any meaningful freedom and compensation? Uh, as I say, first of all, the, the idea that, you know, if Stephen Avery was to, was to pass away tomorrow, that's the end of the case. No, definitely not. These cases, as we've, as we've seen in both of these Cleve Heidelbergs and Cleve Browdis cases, they carry on posthumously. Um, other members of the family benefit and society as a whole benefits when they're compensated by the... Uh, the various corrupt authorities. Uh, anyway, um, that's all I'm going to say for now. I'm going to look forward, hopefully, to having a chat with Mark Holliday tonight. Tomorrow, so we've got one or two things to discuss. Um, I'm just going to say cheerio. Catch you all again soon. Bye for now.